Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of October 3rd, 2022. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we quantify the positions of the various candidates for governor on the level of the permanent fund dividend. There are significant differences. Second, we discuss the recent Salmon State report on ADA and explain why ADA is never going to produce returns comparable to those from the permanent fund corp. And third, we provide our take on why Alaska is always going to be at fiscal risk until the various sides in the debate work on a compromise along the lines of the legislature's 2021 Fiscal Policy Working Group. And now, let's join Michael. So we're going to start off with a weekly top three, and you're going to start off by quantifying the positions of the candidates, the gubernatorial candidates, as it were, um, on the PFD. So let's get let's get started there. Well, I've heard a lot of discussion, or we've heard a lot of discussion about various about the PFD positions of the various candidates. Uh, Dunleavy, you know, talks about the POMB 50-50. Uh, Les talks about a strong PFD, uh, and he's in favor of a strong PFD. Um, and Walker talks about, you know, a PFD that, that we can afford. Um, but, but they really haven't quantified the PFDs, and, you know, and, and in connection with the fact that I, you know, live my life by charts anymore, um, uh, I, I thought I would take a shot at trying to quantify it. Wasn't that difficult? Uh, the Permanent Fund Corporation publishes uh, projections uh, on a monthly basis um, that you can use. They projections of both the what the dividend or the permanent fund, the POMB draw is going to be, and projections of what the statutory net income is. So you can calculate what the PFD is going to be from that for ten years forward. And so I use that as a baseline and uh, and and look at quantifying what, what each of these candidates are talking about compared to the statutory PFD, compared to the baseline of the statutory PFD. And um, it, it, so it, it is interesting. I mean, it surprised me a little bit um, uh, that, that these numbers were, uh, were, came out where they, where they did. All three, can, all three candidates are proposing cuts uh, from the statutory PFD. Um, Dunleavy's POMV 50-50 uh, averaged over 10 years using the 10-year projections that are published by the Permanent Fund Corporation and then calculating what Dunleavy's PFD would be and comparing that to the statutory PFD. Dunleavy's uh, uh, POMV 5050 ends up at about 70% uh, on average over the 10 years uh, uh, of, of what the uh, statutory PFD would be. So he's got about a 30% cut uh, in the statutory PFD in his proposal. Seems bad, but the other two are worse. Les talks about uh, a, a strong PFD, and his 2200 looks a lot like uh, Dunleavy's uh, POMB 5050. They're, they're within about $100 of each other right up front in FY23 or FY24. But over time, Les just sort of grows his by inflation, while Dunleavy's POMB 5050 is at least growing by uh, the rate of return uh, of the permanent fund corporation, which we, which the permanent fund corporation assumes is positive over time, and is and is a faster growth rate than inflation rate. So over time, Dunleavy's gets gets uh, higher than uh, 
higher than lessos. They start close, but but over time, because of the difference in the return rates or the difference in the growth rates, uh, they get uh, they, they separate. And lessos comes in at about 58 percent, 60 percent, if you will, uh, of the statutory PFD. Look at another way uh, where Dunleavy's is POMV 50, 50 less is, is about POMV 40, uh, 60, about, it's about 40% of the P the PFD is about 40% of the POMV, uh, draw. And what's really interesting about that, for those that recall the last election cycle, Mark Begich's proposed PFD, uh, in that election cycle was 40%, a POMV 40, uh, 40 to, um, uh, uh, to the PFD, 10% to education, 10% to something else, and then uh, and then you know inflation proofing was a was a large part of the remainder of that. So um, it it's um, uh, it, it lessons looks a lot like uh, the Begich uh, proposal uh, the last election cycle. Once you once you sort of walk through it, Walker's uh, Walker's been very um, uh, uh, careful not to define a number on his PFD. But if you look at what the leftover would look, would look like, if you looked at what uh, Ivy Spahn holds, Kathy Giesel, others of his supporters have said, uh, the PMV would look like over time. It looks a lot like the 2575 uh, POMV that was in uh, Ivy Spahn Holtz's bill in the House and was in SB 199 over in the Senate right. uh, this last legislative session. So that comes out to about uh, uh, 35%. Uh, of the statutory PFD over the 10 year period, half uh, of Dunleavy's. So if you if you believe in the statutory PFD, all three candidates, uh, major candidates uh, are disappointing. I mean, they're, they're all three at, at significant reductions. Dunleavy, even Dunleavy at, at, at a 30% right. reduction from the well, statutory PFD. And in all fairness, uh, you haven't mentioned Charlie Pierce. He said he favors a statutory PFD, although there's no, uh, I haven't seen a fiscal plan as to how that will work out. But so assumingly, you could say that the blue line is Pierce at this point, because that's the only plan that he's really put. It's the only thing he's really put forward is that he feel he uh, would support a statutory PFD, right? Yeah, uh, to the extent Charlie has a campaign anymore, it's, it's hard to hard to find stuff on, on that campaign. But but yes, you could say that. Um but you're right. He hasn't said how how he would work the rest of the budget. I mean, Dunleavy could say Dunleavy did say in 2018 that he would have favor a statutory PFD or supported a statutory PFD and indeed the payback of the underpayments of the statutory PFD in prior periods. But that didn't work out with the legislature. So um, Pierce hasn't outlined how he could achieve uh, a, a statutory PFD. I well, I mean, again, looking at these numbers, you could see exactly and you could see we've had some Democrats on here recently and they've all basically been talking about how the um, the the permanent fund, the corpus of the fund should be used for government. In fact, we had one yesterday say that's really what it should all be used for. It's just all for government. And you could see that here in in these numbers and in this graph that I'm showing up on the screen and in the numbers you just talked about that you could see more and more they're looking to gather more and more for government. And I would say that this chart is misleading in one way because I don't think that by the time we reach 2030, there would be any PFDs left for the people. I think it would all be sucked up by government at that point. I think it's very optimistic to say that by 2030, 2029, there would be any permanent fund left for the people that it would all be being consumed by government at that point. Well, it's certainly, I mean, that's certainly a possibility, but at least Les is saying he would fix it at 2200 adjusted by uh, adjusted by inflation over time. There, there's there's a th this I, I don't have it on this chart, but there's an interesting thing that pops up when you do it this way. I mean, Les talking about a strong PFD. I mean, that was his initial phrasing before he started quantifying it. Um, he, he combined that with talking about oil taxes, increasing oil taxes. And oil taxes would be used to underpin this strong PFD and would be used also to underpin the additional spending that he wants to do. Well, his, his PFD isn't very strong. I mean, his PFD is, uh, as, as we've got on the chart, is about a you know, 58, 60% of, of statutory PFD. It's about a 40% cut uh, in, the, in the statutory uh, statutory PFD. So, He's 
he he he's contemplating a lot of government growth because he's really he's he's he his proposal on oil taxes is to increase oil taxes substantially by reducing uh, by reducing the credits. Um, and if that's not if that's not supporting a a PFD that's even equal to Dunleavy's, then that's leaving a lot of money left over for additional government spending. So there's there's some knock on effects uh, of, uh, of of his position that that aren't showing up on the chart, but showing a substantial amount, a, a diversion of a substantial amount of revenue uh, over to uh, over to increase government spending. By the time you take into account the combination of increased oil taxes plus uh, the reduction in the in the PFD that uh, that he's proposing. Uh, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, is our guest. Um, I guess this gives us a, a, a good snapshot of what we would be expecting from governors in this regard. Um, have any one of them given us a certain fiscal plan that would achieve these numbers? No, Les would, te- Les would tell you that he has uh, because of the uh, increased oil taxes. But we you know two years ago we had a we had a ballot measure on increased oil taxes that failed 58 to 42 failed by 16%. So the achievability the 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 honesty the the the, the likelihood of achieving those oil tax increases that he's talking about is very low. And so the the likelihood of having the revenues needed to support both his spending and the PFD he talks about is very low. And so the likelihood of of even deeper PFD cuts uh, uh, from his administration, if he goes through with the spending, uh, is 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 much more likely. So it, there's not a there's there's his, his complete fiscal plan really leads you to be because it's so dependent on oil tax increases, really leads you to be uncomfortable about about you know the, the ability to achieve these PFD levels. Right. Walker Walker's Walker's is is I mean it, it, the good and the bad of it is is Walker's probably accurate uh, in, in what he would be able to achieve uh, in PFDs, but it's because he's cutting the PFD so deeply uh, and diverting so much over to, uh, over to government spending to support government spending that, uh, that there, as you, as you pointed out, there isn't much of a PFD left and maybe even less of a PFD by the time we get to 2030. So the, 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 the fiscal Walker's fiscal plan sort of works, but it works because he just cuts the PFD so, so deeply. Right. Dunleavy's Dunleavy's fiscal plan um, is highly dependent on being able to restrain spending. Um, if you look at the ten-year forecast, uh, uh, adjusting the the spending levels for what we for the changes that were made in the last uh, in the last legislature, the long-term changes that were made in the last legislature, and adjusting them just for inflation, um, Dunleavy slips back into deficit. Uh, with these PFD levels, Dunleavy, even with these PFD levels, Dunleavy, Dunleavy slips back into deficits by the end of uh, of his four year term using current oil prices, current oil price projections, the current futures market. So his achievement, there's also significant questions about the achievability of his. Can he, even if he holds spending at inflation, just inflation? Um, growth to, to inflation. Um, he slips back into uh, deficits. He has to reduce, in order to balance the budget, he has to actually reduce spending. And that's something, frankly, that he hasn't done uh, over the over the course of the four years. He did it the first couple of years, but these last two years, when you take into, the, when you take into account the supplemental uh, spending that occurred for FY22 uh, in this last legislature, as well as the FY23 spending, it just blew out, you know, blew out any savings that he had achieved over the first two years. So his credibility in terms of being able to even hold spending at inflation is very low, much less uh, needing to have have real cuts uh, in spending, real as against inflated against inflation, real cuts in spending. Um, the credibility of that's fairly low. Let me touch on briefly, since several people brought it up in the chat room. And uh, and I think you really touched on a nerve uh, for some some people um, is the uh, is the exclusion of uh, of Charlie Pierce from that chart. Um, And I think you touched on it. His campaign has gone. uh, It's like vaporware. It's like it's you know, I haven't heard from him. I haven't seen him. 
Um, he's been radio silent. Uh, he's not been fundraising. He's not been doing it. I mean, this is, you know, kind of like what Dunleavy is doing, but Dunleavy at least has got the power of the incumbency and all the polling ahead of him. Um, so I don't know. I don't well, know. What's happening. I don't know Dun- what's happening here. Dunleavy's at least issuing press releases. I mean, yeah. It's it's it, it there you know you got to question sometimes what's the content of the press release but at least he's issuing press releases I mean right. I, I I understand Charlie may have personal issues and I understand that maybe you know that may be a reason for not being on the campaign trail but you it, it's hard to take a candidate seriously if if he's not if he's not that out there campaigning if he's not out there issuing press releases if he's not talking about the issues I mean I I I'll still rank Charlie I, I'll still. Uh, uh, certainly uh, vote for him. I'm not going to, you know, entirely dismiss him, but, but, you know, let's be honest. He's not out there talking about a plan uh, that, uh, that you know, you know, the fiscal plan that he, that he would have, or the PFD plan that he would have. I mean, you can go to the website you can sort of, you can sort of, you know, parse some of it out, but uh, right. It's, it's hard. It's hard to talk about a full plan that the candidate himself uh, isn't talking about, <laughs> isn't right. talking about a plan. At least, at least from Dunleavy's standpoint, you can look at like the ten-year plan that the administration issued last December. You can look at the press releases. You can look at, you know, statements he's made. You can look at the actions he took in the legislature when, for example, he vetoed the e-cigarette tax. Let's see if I can get us going on that again. Oh, no, uh, but it won't get me started. <laughs> um, but you can you can look at all that. And Les is out there certainly talking about his. He's got a website that, you know, will just put you to sleep it's got so many words on it and you can sort of piece together what he's doing. And Walker's got, you know, the past four years or the, his prior four years as governor and he's got the statements he's made and he's got the supporters that, that have proposed plans that he, that he endorses. Um, so you can piece that together, but Charlie, I mean, there, there's no past record to go to like there is with Dunleavy there are, and Walker. There's no, there's no complete uh, website like there is with less. There's no, presentations at, uh, at, you know, at the chamber or other places, there's no, uh, debate presentations. There's no, uh, 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 responses to, you know, questions from the press. There's no press releases. How, how do you, I mean, we all know what we think <laughs> Charlie's position is on stuff. Um, uh, but it's just hard to, it's hard to give credibility to a campaign that, that isn't talking, isn't, isn't, right isn't issuing press releases, isn't out there in the public. Yeah, no, I'm, um, I, I would, I would really, uh, I would really like to see, uh, I would really like to see uh, more movement on this and, and something come out of this. I know that the whole blow up in the city uh, or in the borough and all that kind of stuff, I know that was a problem, but we, we've got to, we, we, we got to keep, we got to keep moving on. We got to keep moving on, figuring out what we're doing here. So uh, it's important. And if somebody wants a proxy on that chart about for Charlie, uh, okay, use the use the blue line. But you know, then the question you ask, how realistic are these? Um, you know, we don't know for Charlie because we don't know what the rest of the plan is. Um, he started out; he had this great editorial on on K through twelve, right? And that the problem with K through twelve is the amount of spending we're doing we're doing on the administrative level. And I can. His, his pitch was, I can get that under control and we can reduce K through 12 spending by reducing the amount that's spent on administration. Great start. Uh, but that was sort of it. <laughs> and then we went into the void. So it's, um, we, we just don't know. We, we, we can't assess the, the, the likelihood of being able to achieve those PFD levels like we, like, you know, I talked about with Dunleavy and Guerra and Walker. We can't talk about the likelihood of achieving those PFD levels uh, without knowing you know, what the rest of the plan is. Right. Well, I'm, I mean, again, I'm hoping that uh, I'm going to rank Charlie um, and I'm and uh, going to have to rank Dunleavy. I can't, I can't uh, in good conscience rank either of the other two right now, but uh, I guess if nothing else, the stalking horse to prevent the Kirker thing was, I guess the best that we can a- hope to achieve at this point uh, on this, uh, on this one. Well, it, it, to, to be successful, Charlie's actually got to bring in votes. I mean, the whole the whole thing about finishing number four is you bring in additional votes that otherwise weren't going to vote for the for uh, uh, for the the you know the yeah. Republican candidate, and you bring in those additional votes, and they at least rank the Republican candidate or rank Governor Dunleavy second. Brad, give me a tease for number two here, the Ada report. So Ada has uh, uh, Salmon State. Uh, 
Greg Erickson and Milt uh, Baker uh, Barker uh, did a report, economic report on uh, ADA uh, for Salmon State. ADA's disputed the report. Um, there's a reason why the returns are so low that Milt and uh, and Greg found. I think I think they're more correct about their returns than ADA is. But we'll talk about we'll talk about the factors that are going on and why that report looks the way it does uh, when we come back uh, from the break. Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We're continuing now our discussions, the weekly top three. Right now, it's the ADA report. Salmon State put out a surprise report, surprise, um, on ADA's uh, actions. Um, and I guess the first thing I got to say, Brad, I tried not to say it during the break um, because I thought, you know, you and I have talked a lot about this in-state Alaska investment and all these kind of things and how it's kind of a boondoggle for the permanent fund. But ADIA is a funding source for businesses, usually as, as a loan bank and other things that has allowed it. And so I did think that in one way, uh, the Salmon State's report of, and I'm sure you'll get into this, of, uh, of comparing the returns on investment for ADIA to the permanent fund we're kind of an apples and oranges comparison because they're not necessarily designed to do the same thing, but uh, there were some interesting things. So give me your take on the report here overall. Well, they're not designed to do the same thing, but, but I'm not sure what ADA is designed to do is, is a good thing, is a good thing um, or, or how it operates with what it's designed to do is a good thing. Here's the fundamental problem. ADA is never, ever, 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 going to pr produce the kind of returns that the permanent fund does for one reason. There's no, there's, there's no, you create additional jobs. You say your, your role is to create additional jobs. Okay. So you create additional jobs. You say your role is to create additional uh, economic activity, additional investment, additional, you know, uh, uh, profits to private sector, to the private sector uh, resulting from those investments. Okay. You do that. You do a great job at all that. The state gets no return out of that. We have no return on on additional employment. There's no, there's we don't tax, uh, we don't even tax sales, but we don't tax income. Uh, there's no return that comes to the state out of additional employment, out of additional uh, people in the state, additional employment in the state. In fact, it hurts the state to have additional additional uh, people in the state under our under our current fiscal structure. There's no significant return that comes to the state out of additional economic activity. Uh, an additional investment and additional business and additional profits in the state because we have a very we have a fairly slender corporate tax um, and and doesn't and, and it doesn't uh, generate a lot of uh, a lot of revenue from that. So ADA, because it focuses on things that aren't that don't produce returns to the state, is always going to be deficient when you compare it to the when you compare it to the permanent fund because the permanent fund's out there taking its capital, investing it, getting getting returns uh, uh, on its capital on its on its equity investment ada is 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 not trying to achieve those sorts of returns they're trying to achieve returns in other ways in terms of additional employment or additional economic activity and you're just not going to get uh you're just not going to under our current fiscal structure because we don't generate revenues off of off of employment or off of additional profits uh, you're just not going to get the same type of returns out of ADA. So this, this study was a foregone conclusion from the outset because you're, you're not getting the same sort of thing. You're not getting the same, you're not, you're not getting returns back to the state out of the type of activity that ADA's is uh, trying to generate. I, I will say this, that I think, um, that I think this study sort of resurfaces things that we talked about before when we when we you know had the grain silos in Valdez or when we had the barley project or when we when we had the fish processing plant now church um, in South Anchorage. Ada has a very hit and miss uh, sort of history. It it sometimes hits good on projects. Um, uh, the the project up in Nome uh, uh, with Tech Kaminko is a is a good project. They've gotten good returns off of the road that they build up there, that they financed up there. Um, but but they sometimes have very bad uh, projects as well. I mean, we've got $10 million now tied up in in bids for Anwar that are never, ever going to go anyplace. 
but you know, we've tied up uh, money up there as opposed to putting it to, uh, to more productive use. So it's, it, it, it is hit and miss. And the problem I have with ADA and the problem I would have if the permanent fund tried to duplicate what ADA does, which is come in the state and try to generate ac economic activity uh, in the state, what some people want the permanent fund uh, to do as well. Um, it, it is, it is it, it, one, it's not producing returns to, we're taking state money, investing it, but not getting returns back to the state. The, the returns are generally going to the private sector in terms of additional employees and in terms of additional profits for the private sector. We're sort of subsidizing those activities by using, by using state money. Um, but second, um, it, it's hit and miss. And, and, and to some degree, that's because it's politically driven. Uh, you know, politics drove, we want a fish plant in South Anchorage. Politics drove, we want a barley project. Politics drove, we want a, uh, we want a, 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 a grain silos in, uh, in Valdez. I mean, we have these political agendas that get mixed into sort of an industrial policy, a state industrial policy where we're subsidizing, you know, some, some industries trying to make them winners as opposed to losers. Um, and, and that's always going to be sort of hit or miss. Um, so it's, it, it's, it's, it's identifying, you know, the, 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 the problem that we have with ADA in terms of being plus or minus politically driven, uh, being plus or minus, you know, subsidy, its role being to subsidize industry. I've always sort of accepted ADA as, as, you know, as that's just what it's going to do. We want to have something that we say sets industrial policy for the state. And so we've got ADA and we're going to put some money into it. Let's just not put a whole lot of money into it and let right. not, not have a whole lot of money go down the sink. And let's, God, let's not have the permanent fund duplicate what ADA is doing and, you know, and bring additional money into those right. sorts of projects. Let's just, right. let's just sort of keep it confined to ADA. Um, uh, I've, I've never, you know, I've never gone so far as to say we ought to just do away with ADA, uh, because it has had some successes and, you know, maybe that's, you, we need some outlet for those, those people who want to try to generate jobs, uh, at a state level, uh, try to generate jobs, but let's just keep it confined. Um, but anyway, I, I think the report is accurate in the sense that ADA is not going to produce those sorts of returns. It's never going to produce those returns. And it's sort right. of. Foolish, foolish to think that's that's what it's right. ever going to do. Like I said, a little bit of apples and oranges there. Uh, I mean, it was, you know, uh, it's true, but it's not necessarily uh, true in that regard. Uh, all right, let's come to the number three uh, quickly here, which is the battle over Alaska's fiscal plan. Larry Persilli has a piece. I mean, God love Larry Persilli. He can write. Uh, he wrote a piece uh, in the ADN. Uh, talking about, uh, you know, kind of this whole perilous condition about how we, the permanent fund, and, and essentially, um, well, I'll let you get into it here quickly. Well, it, it, it's, a, it's an accurate article in the sense that what he says is oil prices are down, uh, that reduces state revenue, uh, uh, permanent, fund, uh, permanent fund investments are down, the stock market's down, it's taken, you know, the permanent fund's gone down uh, with it, that's going to produce less returns. Uh, in the future, not we're not going negative. We're not going to have you know a, a negative return, but it's producing uh, 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 smaller returns uh, in the future. And so those two revenues, the two, state's two primary revenue streams are both going down. That that exacerbates the fiscal situation that we've already already found ourselves in. Here's, I mean, it, it's typical, Larry, and and you're never going to get him to talk about anything else. But here here's here's what's going on. We've got people who are talking about the fiscal fiscal situation as all or nothing. You either got to do away with the PFD or you've got to give us our full PFD. You, you can't have taxes. You got to have tax. It, it, it is, it, we've got everybody divided up on sides saying, I've got to win everything. I can't, you know, I'm not going to give you any wins. I'm not going to compromise with you. And so we just sort of, it, it, we end up in this suspended animation, fiscal policies in suspended animation, just sort of floating along without without a real plan, just a lot of battles about which side the plan is going to be on. This is really a pitch to go back to the le the, the legislature's uh, fiscal policy working group. They came up with a real plan. They came up with a plan that had numbers that worked. They came up with a plan that sort of resolved this issue going forward. And they did it by 
not coming at it and saying, I've got to win everything. You lose all, you lose everything. I've got to get my full PFD. You, you, you've you got to give in and, and, and cut spending completely to accommodate the full PFD, or I've got to spend everything I want and you've got to give up on the PFD. They came to a compromise that compromised those things. And that's the only way we're going to get through a fiscal plan that's robust enough to survive the ups and downs of the oil prices going up, oil prices going down, stock market going up, stock market going down. To, we, we're going to need that sort of comprehensive plan to uh, to get through this. Well, we've talked about it. I mean, it's a plan. It's one that uh, both sides came together on and kumbaya on. Unfortunately, the business as usual crowd doesn't want to talk about it. And uh, we'll have to see what the makeup of the legislature looks like after November uh, to get a feel as to whether or not that's going to come through. One of the things that really stuck out to me in Larry's article, and maybe I'm wrong on this, but I'm going to read this little blurb to you and you can tell me if I'm wrong. I read this uh, piece and I was like, what? Uh, Larry says that uncommitted fund balance of $3.6 billion in the earnings reserve is what he's talking about. That uncommitted fund balance isn't all that much when you realize stocks and bonds and real estate values can continue falling, cutting deeper into that number. This is the money that's available in the earnings reserve. To which I say, wait a second, the earnings reserve is, although it's part of the permanent fund itself, it's a separate account. It's not affected necessarily by the losses in that regard because it is the earnings that are spun off into that account. Am I wrong on that? I mean, I thought, I mean, it may affect the corpus overall value, but there is a set dollar amount in the earnings reserve account that is there from the earnings, right? Am I, am I, am I wrong on that or am I reading that wrong? Am I reading that wrong? Well, a portion of the earnings reserve is, um, is also paper profits. Um, and it is the paper profits on the balance that's in the earnings reserve. Um, so you've got um, you've got some uh, paper profits that are in there. We do a report. I do a chart once a month at the end of the month, toward the end of the month, uh, that looks at the earnings reserve and divides it into the portion that's already appropriated, that's already you know designated to be going to to certain uses, the portion that's hard cash. Uh, and the portion that is uh, that's paper profits, and um, and there is a portion in there that's paper profits, but it's not it's not the full three point five uh, billion. I can't recall what the last uh, what the last numbers were, but it's not the full three point five billion. So, Larry's Larry's in part um, overblowing the situation because of that, um, uh, but it's not it's not as simple as there's no paper profits in the uh, in the earnings reserve. There there are some in the earnings reserve. The only reason I ask that is because it seems like a lot of times we had a candidate on yesterday that did not understand the difference between the permanent fund and the permanent fund dividend, the differences in the uh, in the funds themselves and and, you know, couldn't really answer the questions as to. And so I think, that again, there's a lot of misinformation or in some cases, malinformation that it kind of is, is being spread that is, uh, you know, bugging people. And, and uh, I think it I think sometimes it's intentionally meant to confuse. Yeah, it's um, there is a surprising thing about the earnings reserve. If you look at that, 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 you know, that we need to keep in mind, if you look at the earnings reserve up until um, June 30th, July 1st, uh, through the last fiscal year, the 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 amount available for appropriation, the, the undesignated amount, the amount that was sort of our uh, our uh, savings, <laughs> our final savings account. Was was higher was was above seven seven billion dollars, and now it's down at three billion dollars, and that's a, that's a big step down, uh, down into down into a lower level. And what happened was, in the last legislature, one of the things they appropriated was they appropriated a, a full amount for the um, inflation proofing, which they hadn't done in a number of legislatures before that. So we were sort of carrying this additional amount in the earnings reserve that had they done full appropriations for the inflation proofing would have already been out of there but because they hadn't it was sort of sitting in there and and was a number that helped inflate you know when governor dunleavy talked about how much we've got in the earnings reserve that we can right. that we can count on to you know pay additional dividends or or to, or to do this or do that um, it sort of inflated that number by sitting in there now that they've appropriated in this coming fiscal year now that they've appro or in the current fiscal year now that they've appropriated to the inflation proofing it's taken that number down, that float number, down to the you know three billion dollar uh, range, 
And frankly, you know, that's not a lot. If you look, if you would, if you assumed, for example, three years of crashed oil prices, three years of down earnings, uh, reduced earnings in uh, uh, in Wall Street, and so the so the permanent fund draw, the POMB draw, uh, was uh, was starting down, um, and no adjustments to to spending that we you know we have to have all this stuff, so we keep spending. Um, the only place to go, I mean, we've ran through the SBR, we've ran through the, we're largely run through the CBR. The only place left to go, uh, is, is that earnings. is, is the earnings reserve. Right. And $3 billion is, you know, keeping in mind that we've run through $15 billion in the last decade, uh, uh of saying, you know, it's going to change tomorrow. Right. It's gonna, it, $3 billion isn't much, uh, yeah. uh when, yeah. when, you, when you think about it in that context. What's your take on the appointment of uh, of Devin Mitchell? What What do you think? I mean, is this an inspired pick, an uninspired pick? You got any opinion on this? Well, we discussed Devin the, a few weeks ago when he was named acting revenue commissioner, and I think uh, I think my my term was uninspired. It was an uninspired choice. I, I the 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 permanent corp, the permanent fund corporation role is different than the Department of Revenue role. Permanent fund corporation role is you wake up every morning and you need to be thinking about how do how do I position uh, this corporation to you know maximize returns over the long term. Department of Revenue role, uh, I think you ought to wake up every morning and go how do I balance how do I get a better balance to the to the revenue of the state to lower the impact on the economy and to and to make it equitable across Alaska families. So there are different roles. Devin, uh, as I described him um, when we were talking about him for revenue commissioner, Devin is, he's a cheerleader. He's been a cheerleader for, for whatever the, for whatever administration that's been in power wants. He, for example, when Walker was in power, he went to uh, Wall Street and said, don't worry about our bonds because we got this thing called the permanent fund that spins off earnings and we'll just use our earnings to, to cover whatever deficits we have. So don't worry about it. Don't worry about the coverage ratio on our bonds. Essentially, you know, not talking about the PFD and the role the PFD plays. And I've I've been a big critic of of that spin that he put on it, that the Walker administration put on it, and that Devin put on it uh, in the Wall Street discussions. So I don't expect him. I don't expect him to play a major role in preserving the PFD. I guess uh, <laughs> in this new role, but maybe that's not that. Maybe that's not what you want out of a permanent fund corporation, right? Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Brad, uh, thanks for sticking with us on this uh, and uh, finishing up. Uh, we look forward to seeing what happens next week. Yeah, it'll be uh, it'll be an interesting week as it always is during a, <laughs> during a campaign cycle. Maybe Charlie will come back. Maybe we'll hear from I, Charlie. <laughs> fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. We'll see then, what happens. And then maybe I could do a fiscal analysis of, of Charlie's plan. His plan, right, exactly. All right, Brad, thank you so much for coming on board. We appreciate you joining us today. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the weekly top three.